and talk through some of the, the challenges as far as I see them as um, with regards to both our, our health globally and global health, and we can discuss whether those are the same things or not. And my comments here are very much coming from experience of having worked in a number of biotech companies, worked in major pharma for 12 years, and now in the glorious environment uh, of academia. So let's just start really on the crux of the problem I want to talk through. So drug discovery and development is incredibly long, incredibly complex, as Paul was saying. Maybe 15 years start to finish and taking an awful lot of money. I think there's only two points to really make across this slide. One is that there is a weak link late on in the process, so we're seeing a significant number of failures at a phase in development by which we've already invested a huge amount of time and, to be frank, a shed load of money due to the costs escalating rapidly from left to right across this slide. And secondly, we pick up the, the projects we work on right at the start. So if we're getting the hypothesis wrong, if we're getting the fundamental approach to treat the disease wrong up front, we can spend a huge amount of time before we find out that we've actually got the wrong approach in the first place. And this is raising the question that Paul also mentioned in terms of can we actually afford to discover new medicines, and there is a huge amount of reveling in the literature that, that Paul contributes to in both, both the business and scientific literatures, really um, pulling apart all the data to say that at best the pharma world is at a standstill in terms of its output, at worst it is in significant decline in terms of the cost, um, the number of drugs you're getting out per unit cost substantially decreasing. And the sort of factoids that get thrown out are really quite um, discouraging and quite demotivating for somebody like me who's trying to work in this area. And you really don't have to be the most uh, sharp uh, business analyst to work out that with these sorts of facts and statistics, there really is a problem here in terms of the fundamental way we're going to go after drug discovery and development for all uh, diseases going forwards. There's been a big impact close to home, and I've been personally impacted by, by this as well. The, um, the major research sites within the UK, there's been a number of those that have closed over the last few years. This has been a global phenomenon, but the UK has been hit particularly badly, and this was one of the industries that was uh, historically very strong and very productive within the UK. So I'm just going to pick on four themes to, to go from here really, in terms of what we can do about this. And this is very much a personal perspective in terms of what I think uh, the challenges are leading us with. Firstly, in terms of that late stage failure, the key thing I think we can do here, particularly with the different uh, model of bringing um, academic involvement, is to actually get a much better understanding of the fundamental disease biology in the first place. We need to really link the hypothesis of the disease, get the right approach to treating that disease up front, and then run a smaller number of projects which have, which have a better chance of being more successful. There is an immoral and unethical duplication of early stage drug discovery activities. There is an enormous duplication of effort of um, all pharmaceutical companies around the same small number of targets all, again, pursuing the same approach. And that leads to an enormous waste of scientific effort. And we need to define pre-competitive and non-competitive areas of space to really enable the early stages of drug discovery. The downsizing in pharma, particularly in this country, is reducing a lack of expertise. I would argue that we can harness the training and teaching powers of institutions such as universities to come back in and uh, rise um, to that challenge of producing a new generation of people who can actually design uh, new medicines. And finally, the big pharma companies already have half of their pipelines from the outside world. So despite um, the, the existence of big discovery engines, they're buying in 50% of the late stage portfolio to have the sorts of pipelines that are demanded by the shareholders. So clearly we can respond to that by continuing to produce more drug discovery outside of big pharma. And there are lots of good models of collaborations that have started up that have tried to link the basic science much better into the drug development pathway. And there's a few of these outlined here which have done a very good job. But um, Anne made the request that we should be a bit more provocative in terms of some of the statements we were making. And I think there are some models which are going very badly at the moment as well. I think one model which I find uh, particularly surprising is the rush to build um, major research centres, major industrial research centres, in the vicinity of major academic research centres. <coughs> so the, um, the model here is if you have a, a, a new headquarter building in the vicinity of some of the cleverest people in the world, so you've got all of these in the Boston MIT area, somehow the, the proximity to this, uh, this cleverness will 
produce and reinvigorate your pipeline and give you an, an innovative uh, late stage portfolio. Maybe. <laughs> From my point of view, it's been easy to collaborate with whoever you want to, wherever you want, however you want for decades. It's great to have face-to-face -face contact, but I don't think you need to cart your whole research institute behind you to have those conversations. I think collaborations are much more on the shared values and the trust and the ways of working, and much less on the physical proximity. I think the second one which um, isn't good is, is open innovation. So open innovation is a phrase which uh, farmers is using very widely at the moment. I've been to a number of, of panel discussions and meetings around open innovation. And what I've also experienced from this side of the table now is going to companies who are acting in the spirit of open innovation. They are very open with you in terms of the data you're bringing and telling you whether you think you, you're being innovative or not. But there is no reciprocal sharing. There's no opening up of the contents that they have access to and the data that they have access to. So it's very much a one-way uh, open innovation track. In contrast to that, there are some great models going around. I've only got two as a highlight, from one from industry and one from academia. This is a, uh, a GSK-funded model. So it was started in the GSK labs in Madrid in Tres Cantos. It's focused on diseases of the developing world, and it allows researchers to apply for money to go to the labs to, um, to use equipment and facilities of a pharmaceutical industry standard, which would be very difficult for them to access otherwise. And um, the, the premises that this is built on is very much on the open sharing of the data, which is great. The second one is the Structural Genomics Consortium. So this is an academic group. It's a um, not-for-profit, public-private partnership, incredibly well-funded. And this group is recognizing the value of basic science research. So this intentionally complex slide here is highlighting their active um, work in the area of epigenetics. And if you're not uh, familiar with epigenetics, I advise you to go and have a, a read around it. It's going to have an impact on all of the diseases we're treating going forwards. This is a family of proteins called the Broma domain proteins. Each of these letters here represents a different protein. All these colors are subfamilies. It is incredibly complex. What has happened in the past when um, we found new areas of science like this in the pharmaceutical industry is we would pick one and then we would all follow that same one, we would all research that same one and we would all find more or less the same things. What the SGC is doing is actually saying well let's produce a toolbox. So it's working its way around these family members producing a toolbox of biology, chemistry, uh, information, reagents and then putting that out into the public domain. So what's happening then is labs all over the world are picking up those tools they're doing the basic work to really link the disease and the protein together and they're really giving that fundamental hypothesis understanding of how shall we go and treat the disease. So it's a completely different way to go about uh, starting drug discovery work. And the third one I'm going to mention is a much smaller initiative, a much newer initiative and it's what I'm trying to do here at the moment and it's a model which a number of groups are doing um, around the world and it's essentially where we're taking sorry, a a group of people who have got a long track record of doing drug discovery in an industrial environment because drug discovery and development has only really been happening in the industry, so that's where the skills have been. We're coming from that um, background and we are embedding into the academic environment, so embedding into this ability to access the fundamental biology, the fundamental clinical hypotheses and the basic science. We're not trying to do it at arm's length, we're trying to really be part of it. And we've got multidisciplinary programs of drug discovery running in a number of areas and of course we can choose the therapeutic areas to go after so we're not having to do it in my previous life which is driven by a purely uh, market driven need we can do this <coughs> in the areas where we perceive a genuine need or we perceive genuine advances in terms of basic science which is it's an incredible privilege but the key to this is having the expertise coming in but having the university as well being prepared to put up significant amounts of money to actually get the whole initiative started So I'll just close from there with just a final provocative statement, really, because we're talking about global health quite a lot today, and I've discussed global health in the context of my work here, but also in the context of the work I've done in the past. And global health has two very, very different meanings, as far as I see it. The first is the meaning here, where particularly through the activities I've been involved with in the past, global health was very much more centered around a growing market, so particularly about how do you widen the access of the chronic 
uh, disease market into countries which formerly could not pay for it. And that is still where most of the funding is coming from, and that's where most of the funding I can apply for academically is focused as well. As opposed to clearly the number of initiatives which are very high profile and which uh, get a lot of press in terms of the activities we're doing in this country. But as academic drug discovery, this is still an incredibly challenging area to get funded relative to um, the more um, chronic non-communicable disease areas. Oh, thank you very much.